All right, guys, this is my heritage letter. Long Peak Inn, just a mountain inn. Scenery and seclusion, Inos A. Mills. It's this park, Colorado, January 27th, 1915. On the trail to the peak, 9,000 feet above the tides. My dearest friends, having done what little I can over the past several years to make people friendly to the trees and flowers of my beloved Rocky Mountains, I have just received the greatest news today. Yesterday, President Woodrow Wilson signed into law the establishment of Rocky Mountain National Park. The creation of a national park to protect our Rockies will help preserve its beauty for generations to come. Within national parks is room, glorious room, room in which to find ourselves, in which to think and hope, to dream and plan, to rest and resolve. Now the Rockies will forever serve that purpose for the world. As a young boy, I grew up hearing my parents' stories of the majestic mountains of Colorado. I enjoyed the outdoors, yet I was so sickly as a child that the doctor said I should stay indoors as much as I was able. Finally convinced I might not survive my illness, my parents sent me to live in Colorado as the mountains were believed to aid in healing. I was an avid reader, but books alone could not provide the life of adventure I longed to live. So I was glad for the chance to see the mountains I have heard about since birth. I loved living in the mountains and spending more time outdoors. Not only did I survive, indeed, I thrived in the cool mountain air. When I first moved to Colorado, I worked at Long Peaks House, a large, a lodge owned by my relatives who provided shelter for tourists and guided hikes up Long Peak. My 15th summer, my cousin Carlisle guided me on my first climb up to the summit of the peak. From the tip top, we could see more than 100 miles at, in, to any point on the compass. From that day forward, I studied the trails and began to work as a natural guide, as a nature guide. I worked hard at the lodge in the summers and in the mines of Montana during the winters to earn enough money to purchase my own homestead with the view of Long's Peak. In 1889, I traveled to San Francisco, California. While there, I visited the Pacific Ocean and met a stranger on the beach. He and I began to talk of our fondness for nature and sharing it with others. This man, the conservationist John Murray from Yosemite, became my mentor and friend. Murray taught me to use my stories to teach, you, teach people all across our country about the importance of nature. He encouraged me to work towards the protection of the Rocky Mountains as a national park. My life then took a new path, one of educating people about the beauty of nature and how to protect it. I owe everything to Murray. If it hadn't been for him, I would have been a mere gypsy. Instead, my chief aim became to arouse interest in the outdoors. Throughout my many years exploring and camping in the mountains, I had kept my observation of the birds, flowers, and trees in my pocket notebook. I turned my adventures in nature, my tales of storms and snow, flowers and sunshine, beaver dams and grizzly bears, including my own pet grizzlies, Johnny and Jeannie, into stories from magazines and books that teach people about the value of the natural world. I am usually considered an authority on many things about out of doors. All my stories, photographs, and lectures about the wildlife on the Rockies has helped them to finally win the favor of our Congress as a land worth preserving. I hope you will soon come to see our Rocky Mountains, where I shall guide you to the tops to the top of Long's Peak, so you may see one of the greatest views of the land of the Continental Divide. Very truly yours, Inas Mills. So here is a picture of Inas Mills, 1870-1922. And this is a picture of one of his books he wrote, the cover art. This is the Heritage Letter. Welcome back. This is an extra letter I received when I signed up for the Heritage Letter subscription. So, from the desk of John Murray, I'm probably saying that wrong. I apologize. <laughs> April 15th, 1903. My dear friend, 
Thank you for your recent letter. I am delighted that you plan to visit Yosemite for a day this summer and will gladly accompany you, accompany you as a tour guide while you are here. Since you asked me to provide you with the general outline of what you would see here in my plan for our grand one day excursion, I have also included a map of the area so you can get your bearings a bit before you come. We'll start the day with a hike to the upper Yosemite Fall. The trail leaves the valley on the east side of the largest earthquake taluses opposite Sentinel Rock. As it passes close by the Great Fall, you'll see magnificent views as you approach it and pass through the spray. You may not get very wet, but when the snow is melting fast, one can get quite can get well drenched. From the from there, the trail zigzags up a narrow canyon between the fall and a plain mural cliff that was burnished, burnished here and there by glacial action. Just below the head of the fall, we'll stop a while on the flat iron fenced rock beside the enthousi enthusiastic throng of starry comet-like waters to hear their glorious music gathered and compassed from the snowstorms, hail, rain, and windstorms that have fallen on their basin. After refreshing ourselves, there we will follow the trail through the silver fir and pine woods to Eagle Peak, where I'll show you the most com comprehensive view of all the views of the on the north wall. We'll linger there for an hour or two, gazing, dreaming, and studying the tremendous top topography of the land. From there, we can trace the valley's rim to the Grand El, Capita, El Captain Ridge and down its burl where you'll see amazing beauty such as you have never before held, before beheld. Finally, we drag ourselves away from the summit and go to the head of Ribbon Fall and across the Ribbon Creek Basin with all of its beauty as we move on towards the Big Oak Flat Stage Road. We'll enjoy the glorious scenery as we walk through the valley all the way to our camp at the foot of El Capitan. It will be a full day that will leave you filled with wonder at the everlasting impressions of the nature you will see. If you can extend your trip a few days, there are many other sites I would like to show you. I was recently at Cathedral Peak again, which I sketched for you here. I love to be able to take you there, as well as to Mount Hoffman, Mount Dana, and the Vernal and Nevada Falls. No matter how long you can stay, it will be a truly magnificent trip. You'll see enough grandeur and beauty to last you a lifetime. i also like to show you my journal so you can see my method of steadying the world around me as I drift around about from rock to rock, from stream to stream, and from groove to groove. I hope that as you enjoy Yosemite, you will allow nature's peace to flow into you as sunshine flows into trees and that you will further and you will be further committed to helping me preserve our wild areas for future generations. I am yours in nature, John Muir. Here is the portrait eighteen thirty eight to nineteen fourteen and some facts and the map that he said would be included the trail that they would take. This is the extra I got when I signed up for the Heritage Letter subscription. This is the American Heritage Adventure Letters or letter. Rocky Mountain National Park. Hello my friends. This morning I awoke to the calming lullaby of the gently flowing waters of the Fall River and the sweet melody of songbirds chirping in the trees. But the crisp mountain air was cool and fresh, filled with the scent of Douglas fir, lodge pole, and ponderosa pines and Eggman spruce. I snuggled deeper into my sleeping bag for a few extra minutes of warmth before I got up to start my day. As I emerged from my tent, the sunshine broke over the horizon, flooding the clearing where my campsite lay golden light signaling the beginning of another wonderful day in Rocky Mountain National Park. As I prepared for my day, I tidied up my tent, ate a quick breakfast, 
laced up my hiking boots and made sure that the bear box holding my food rations was well secured before I took a few minutes to reflect on all that I had seen explored so far. My first day here I climbed up long peaks to see the view that made Ennis Mills the father of Rocky Mountain National Park fall in love with the Rockies and devote his life to preserving this majestic place. It was a strenuous climb up the face of the peaks, sheer vertical rock faces. I had to scramble on the rocks many times to keep my footing, but I made it, I, but I made it to the summit. Mills was right. From the tip top of Long Peaks, over 14,000 feet above sea level, one can see more than 100 miles to any point on the compass. The view from Long's Peak is spectacular. The next day, I hiked from Bear Lake to Emerald Lake in the glowing early morning light. Halliot Peak reflected brilliantly off the waters of Bear Lake. The trail made a steady climb up to Nymph and Dream Lakes, where I encountered the sweet fragrance of abundant wildflowers. The surface of Nymph Lake was even dotted with beautiful yellow pond lilies. I caught glimpses of Halliot Peak, Long Peaks, and the jagged spries of Flat Top Mountain throughout my hike. Pine tree trees lined the path through Tyndall Gorge as I pressed upward to Emerald Lake. As I neared the lake, sunlight shimmered off the surface of its green waters. Nestled serenely between the mountains, Emerald Lake was breathtaking. Once I reached the shore, I pulled off my hiking boots and wadded into the refreshing glacial waters. I sat for a couple hours, taking in the view and drawing in my nat nature journal before I headed to Marine Park. There are dozens of elk grazed in the lush open meadows at the edge of the forest. I heard the distinctive call of bugling elk in the distance as more elk flooded into the meadows lit by the fading twilight. I'm writing to you now from Milner Pass on top the Continental Divide. Here on this mountain ridge, North America split into all waters flowing east of the divide eventually reach the Arctic or Atlantic Oceans. All waters flowing west eventually reach the Pacific Ocean. It's fascinating to be standing here on top of the Great Divide with my sturdy trekking pose in my hand and my backpack full of rain gear, extra layers of clothes, and delicious trail snacks. Rocky Mountain National Park stretches out before me. As far as my eyes can see, adventure awaits me from peak to glorious peak. Lizzie Jane. Here is the postcard for the month of May. And I included the extra letters of um, Yosemite Park as well. I hope you enjoyed May's Heritage Letter subscriptions, both of them. And I will catch you on my next video, which is Letters from Afar. Guys, hello everyone. This is my extra letter I received when I signed up for the American Heritage Adventure, Yosemite National Park. Dear friends, wow, I just finished my third day exploring one of those amazing places in America. I've heard about the glorious Yosemite National Park for so long that I finally had to see it for myself. Yosemite is located in Central California, deep in the heart of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The Sierra Nevada is part of the American Cordillera, a chain of overlapping parallel mountain ranges that stretches all the way from Alaska and brook ranges in Alaska south to the Rocky Mountain and Cascade. Cascades through Mexico Sierra Madres and the mountain ranges of Central America, then finally flowing into the Great Andes Mountains of South America. This chain forms the western backbone of all the Americas and also the backbone of the volcanic arc that makes up the eastern half of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Native Americans from the I am gonna butcher this so bad and I apologize. From the Awahi tribes made Yosemite their home long before it was discovered by settlers in the early 1850s during the California Gold Rush. Once it was discovered, everyone who visited wanted to write about it, draw pictures of it, photograph it, and encourage others to come see and explore this beautiful valley. On my first day here, I arrived at the Yosemite Valley via a Porto Portal Road early in the morning. I found a place 
to park my car then headed off into the valley on foot carrying my day pack with plenty of snacks my travel journal camera and exploring gear i made my way into the valley hiking along the merced river and was quickly greeted with the thunderous sound of bra bra bridal veil fall one of the park's many waterfalls. As I gazed at the flowing waters crashing down from the val from the fall, my hot face was cooled by the delightful mist of its spray before I continued my journey deeper into the valley. Through the trees I saw the form of the great El Capitan, the gentle monolith appear, rising over 3,000 feet from its base to its summit. It kept so impressive that it took my breath away. I'd excitedly headed over to the trailhead for the Upper Yosemite Falls Trail to begin the hike to the summit. It took several breaks to enjoy the views of the valley, the Sentinel Yosemite Falls, and Half Dome on my way to the top. It was an incredible hike with stunning views and amazing wildlife. Each breath I, each breath I took, it, I took was filled with the scent of firm pine trees and clear fresh air. Caught a glimpse of a great gray owl and a black bear. While well, hiking through the forest, and I saw a par peregrine falcon to do its stoop, a rapid corkscrew drive dive from the top of the falls. My second day here, I explored. The, I explored the valley, then crawled into my tent for bed early, so I could rest before I climb Half Dome today. I awoke well before dawn this morning and headed straight to the mist trail. The trail climbed. 4,300 feet in elevation before I even reached the famous cables. Climbing the cables up the face of Half Dome was hard and a bit scary at times, but I'm so glad I did it. The view from the nearly 5,000 foot high summit is absolutely amazing. I plan to spend a few more days exploring Yosemite and filling my travel journal with drawings and notes before I head off to my next adventure, Lizzie Jane. Here is the postcard and this is the extra letter I received when I signed up for the American Heritage Adventure. Welcome! This is my letter, letters from afar for the month of May. Greetings. The train station in Paris was bustling the afternoon Travelers of all sorts rushed to the station towards their platforms while I waited in a long line at the ticket booth. I was counting out the coins in my change purse. A gentleman in front of me leaned heavily on his cane as he fumbled around in his own bag. Bonjour, madame, where are you headed today? He asked me, and as we waited. Istanbul, sir, I'm quite excited. I replied, suddenly, a strong breeze from a passing train yanked a piece of paper from his grasp. No, the man exclaimed, but he couldn't run after it. I looked distraught. I had to help. So I chased after the piece of paper as the lady behind me took my spot in line. I cha Just in time, I snatched it up before it was trampled and learned it wasn't just a paper, but a photo of a young girl. The back was signed, <laughs> G to me, Grand Prix. I love you, Grandpa. I don't know French. I rushed back to the old man and delivered his beloved photograph. He sighed in relief and thanked me before I took my place at the end of the line. When I finally reached the ticket counter, the clerk gave me a smile and said, Madam, your ticket has been paid for already. He handed me a ticket that said, Sim Simplin Orient Express, Paris to Istanbul, first class. But who? I asked in disbelief. He pointed toward the old man who was hobbling away towards his platform, turned back to me, and tipped his hat with a warm smile. I could not believe I was about to take a ride on the Orient Express. This infamous train journey is the pinnacle of luxurious travel, something I'm not accustomed to in the slightest. It was an unfor unforgettable affair. Let me tell you all about it. I arrived at my platform and was greeted by the conductor with a bone. All aboard, he shouted with gusto. A group of finely dressed people began to climb aboard, and then me. I looked down on my worn trousers and boots and felt just like a smidge 
out of place. But soon the excitement took over and I, long, and I no longer cared what I looked like. I wasn't prepared for what awaited me inside. As soon as I stepped aboard, I was ushered to my very own private cabin. It was tiny but charming with a soft cushion bench. Shiny wooden finishes, a tasseled lamp, and a small tray with treats and chocolates awaiting me. I sewed my pack under the seat and plopped down as the train began to chug forward. After some time, there was a knock on my cabin door, and a man with white gloves invited me to the dining car for refreshments. I followed him down the corridor, and before I even opened the door, I could hear the chatter of people and the cheerful songs of a jazz pianist. The interior was stunning, with Chinese lacquered walls, plush velvet seating, and crystal lighting. Tea, madam? asked the white-gloved man. I nodded with glee as he directed me to my seat. He rushed me over with a porcelain he rushed over with a porcelain cup of black tea, cream, sugar, and a tear tray of flaky pastries, all for me. I nibbled the delicious delicacies as I listened to the music and watched the road speeding by outside. I could get used to this, I thought to myself, and I did, for the journey to Inseppel took almost an entire week. We traveled across all of Europe, through tunnels, over mountains, and across bridges. I enjoyed meal after four-course meal, luxurious turn-down services with silken sheets and feather pillows. I even made a few friends by playing cards with the fellow passengers in the cigar coach. They seemed to enjoy my stories of adventure. By day three, I even learned to raise my pinky while enjoying my twice-daily tea time. As I savored the last of my poached lobster and caviar, the train squeaked to a halt on the final afternoon. I could tell we had arrived. Frankly, I felt a bit sad. The journey was utterly lovely, every last minute of it. But as I walked out into the station and looked down at my dusty boots, I couldn't help but think about the old man in Paris. While the extravagances were very nice, I enjoyed them so much because they came from the kindness of someone's heart. I smiled as I looked up towards the grand city of Istanbul with plenty of new things to see and plenty more kind people to meet. The gateway to the east, they call it. That familiar bubble of excitement filled me once again and I again and off I went. Until my next letter, Isabel. Here is the field notes. So we have the map. Here is Paris to Istanbul. So this is the the red is the highlighter route they took. And then here is the other side. So you have here, there was no showers or baths on the train, only toilets. Passengers are expected to take sponge baths using soap and a wash basin. So a picture of uh, the soap on the crown, the Orient, Orient Express. Transported many interesting travelers, including spies, famous actors, and even royalty. Rumor has it that the king of Bulgaria demanded that he drive the train through his own country, which he did at frightening speeds. And then you, they give you a little challenge like find the seven teacups in the letter. And then twice daily, the, uh, the afternoon made and unmade every bed on the train. In an average season, it's estimated they spend more than 4,000 hours on that simple task. That's 165 days. I'm assuming this gentleman was... No, here it is. I think this... I'm not sure. Could be the gentleman that bought her the ticket. And then here's a closer look of the painting. Oh, the drawings. Found a few of the teacups. Here's one. And then oh, the obvious one here. And then... I know um, this one, the teacup is up here, but let me give you, here's the full down, beautiful. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed that, you subscribe to my channel, thumbs up or thumbs down if you want, you know, uh, interaction with the video is great, and I'll see you in my next video, bye!